if you're a big company and you have, you know, your arms in many different baskets and you're producing lots of different things, and let's say another company wants to come compete with you with cereal, well, you can sell your cereal at or below the cost of production for a little while, drive them out of business, and then go back to making more money like you were before. Um, there's also, we, you know, talked a little bit about a lot of other kind of really nefarious things happening on the supermarket shelves. I mean, just where things are placed, you know, has a lot to do with how much money and power different companies have. So there are things that are called slotting fees. So a corporation will pay um, more money to have their um, items, you know, in the center of an aisle at eye level. Maybe, you know, even additional money for those kind of end of aisle displays that you can see. That's all paid for. And so if you don't have that kind of money, if you can't pay to play, then you end up having your stuff shelved somewhere else. Sometimes supermarkets even charge you to actually like keep their food on the shelves, right? So there's, there's a lot going on here. Welcome to the Real Organic Podcast. I'm Lindley Dixon, co-director of the Real Organic Project. We're a grassroots farmer-led movement with an add-on organic food label to distinguish organic crops grown in healthy soils and organic livestock raised on pasture. You just heard from Amanda Starbuck, a policy analyst with Food and Water Watch, whose everyday work involves strategizing against the corporate mergers, consolidation, and greenwashing that's taken over our supermarket shelves. Every time I talk to her, I learn so much about how our food system really works, and this interview was no different. I'm so excited today to be speaking with Amanda Starbuck. She is the research director at Food and Water Watch. And last time we spoke, Amanda, you blew me away with your knowledge of the food system. And so I'm really excited that we're getting an opportunity to speak again today. So hello. Hi, thank you for having me. Tell me a little bit about Food and Water Watch and what you do. Yeah, so we've been around for just over 15 years. Um, we are really at our heart an organizing organization. Um, so everything that we do is really trying to push for bold solutions to some of the biggest threats that are facing our, our food, our water, and our climate. And so as the research director, I help lead a team of about four researchers to produce materials that really kind of push our, our solutions forward, right? So everything we do, it's not sitting in an ivory tower and, you know, talking to other intellectuals. It's really building um, materials that our organizers can use in the field, that our policy folks can use on the Hill to really kind of push for the solutions that, that we need. Um, and a lot of our work really is around, um, you know, um, encouraging organic regenerative um, food systems, lessening the climate impact, rejecting corporatization of our water systems, and also just, you know, ensuring that we have a livable climate. I remember our first hearing about Food and Water Watch going to the National Organic Standards Board meetings and meeting, you know, representatives there from your organization. So I know you do really good work that's focused on policy and change. And so many of us are friends and, you know, in this movement because we got into this just because it's, um, you know, obviously it's a passion for us to, um, you know, there's lots of ways to make money out here, but we really believe strongly in all this stuff. Could you give us a little bit of background of, for you, how you ended up working in good food? Yeah, absolutely. So I've always, farming has always been, you know, on the periphery of my life. Um, I did not grow up on a farm, unfortunately. My mother did, and her goal in life was not to marry a farmer, <laughs> and she succeeded in that twice. Um, you know, her experience with farming was, you know, monoculture, wheat farming, um, in the Great Plains of North Dakota. And, you know, it was a really, it was a really hard life for my grandparents, and I think she saw that and recognized it. Um, you really kind of at the mercies of the markets at the time. Um, there wasn't a lot of growth and room for, you know, being more creative on the farm at that time. And so, you know, it just wasn't a lifestyle that really interested her. So she, she left it. But I was always interested. I always loved the outdoors. I was always interested in growing things and such. And so I went to college for to become an English major, just kind of explored a lot of different things. And then after college, I was just really kind of struck with the idea of like, where does our food actually come from? Because I thought I knew, <laughs> having grown up, you know, surrounded by farming communities. Um, but it wasn't until I started like kind of reading and digging below the surface that I, you know, I, I just realized that, look, I live in a place of like some of the most agricultural productivity that we have in the country, in the world, in the breadbasket of the world. But pretty much everything I buy comes from a supermarket from God knows where. <laughs> and so I realized that even though we're producing so much food, we're not eating the food that is really kind of growing next to us. And so I started to kind of, you know, pick off the different layers of the onion and really got kind of deeper into the weeds of, of what's really going on. Um, and so I think, you know, I bring that 
you know, not, not personal farming experiences, but at least, you know, an appreciation for that, the lifestyle and the people um, behind it. But also, you know, I think that story brings, I bring a little bit of uh, perspective on, you know, the people who are farmers having those roots within farming country, um, but also just a passion for the people who, who are farmers. You know, I, I feel like when I came to Washington and I was in graduate school studying food policy, a lot of my classmates, you know, were really disparaging towards farmers, especially farmers in the Midwest, you know, blaming them for taking subsidies, blaming them for growing too much corn. And it was just this complete lack of awareness of what goes into farming, how hard it is, how expensive it is, how difficult it is to change your production systems, and really how much is driven by the market of what what farmers plant and all the decisions that they make. So to blame them and, you know, to have you know, all be focused on how many subsidies they take and not why do farms need subsidies in the first place, I think is really a you know, a very hurtful kind of distraction. And you're not going to build um, connections between, you know, policymakers and urban communities and farmers as long as you kind of really keep those divides. Yeah, it's so interesting you say that because the system is almost set up for them to farm in this way. And they're also in a lot of debt. So it's so risky to kind of branch out and try something else. I live in Southwest Colorado and have family in Minnesota and we drive home. And you're right. You, we think we don't eat the, all the food that we drive by is basically the dent corn and the soybeans. That's all you see out the window forever, right? For miles and miles. But we actually are eating a lot of it, right? I know, I know a lot goes to ethanol, but in some weird way, that is after it's either processed or it's, it goes into the CAFO meat. Like we, we do eat that food. And so could you talk a little bit? I guess there were, that was a two-part question. Like the farmers are kind of stuck in this system Let's start there with the, like, why are they only growing dent corn and soybeans? Why do we see that forever? Let's start with that. Yeah, that's a very, a very long and um, complex answer to that. But, you know, farmers, we're overproducing in this country. I think that's something that a lot of people don't recognize. You know, we think about hunger and there's, you know, nearly, a, you know, 800 million people or whatever that are, that go hungry within our world. There's you know, scarce resources in certain parts of the world. And so we, we don't really think of hunger issues as being an excess issue. But really in this country, we grow too much. <laughs> we grow too much corn, especially too much soy. Um, and that's why you have these innovative uses for it. You know, things like ethanol, things like now making plastic out of corn and stuff, just trying to find new markets for something that we just have a little bit too much of. Um, and so even though we do have a lot of it, and as you said, we do eat a lot of it, you know, maybe not directly, um, it's a very inefficient way of, of you know, producing calories. Um, you know, you think about all the calories that go into to growing corn and soy, then to all the energy that goes into transforming that into livestock feed. It's a lot more efficient to really just plant food that we're going to eat um, directly. But why do we plant so much? Um, we plant so much because we don't have um, supports in place anymore to, to prevent overproduction. So... <clears throat> You know, I grew up, again, in farming community, and we talked a lot about the Dust Bowl, and I would hear about the dirty 30s from my grandma, who grew up on a farm. And I had just assumed that, you know, the Dust Bowl was this natural disaster, that all of a sudden, you know, there were terrible storms and droughts, and it blew topsoil away. But that was really the result of, you know, over a decade of overplanting um, and really kind of intensively using the land. And why did farmers do that? They did that because prices were low. Um, prices were really high during World War I because, you know, Europe was stuck in this terrible war. We fought it too, but we fought, you know, abroad. And so America really fed Europe during much of the war. So prices were really high. Farmers were incentivized to plant more in order to reap the benefits from those prices. But then when Europe began to recover, that demand fell down. Now, farming is very different than other, you know, sorts of production, right? So if you're if you're manufacturing a widget up there and all of a sudden the demand slows, you know, it, that could be hard on you, but you could, you know, reduce your production. You can maybe flip a switch on your machinery and just kind of, you know, produce less. That doesn't happen with farming. If you've planted, you know, potatoes in the spring, you're harvesting potatoes in the fall. Um, and so farming just goes on, on a different system like that. And so what farmers actually do oftentimes in the face of low prices, sometimes they'll even plant more because that's the only hope they have, you know, and that oftentimes means, you know, moving into production systems that are, you know, not very sustainable, things like monoculture, um, <clears throat> excessive use of chemical inputs, even, you know, farming on, on marginal land. And so 
that had been happening for, you know, a whole decade. And, you know, the government was not really stepping in and doing enough to, to stabilize prices. So what happened in the 30s, then we think about the New Deal um, and we think about, you know, the worker conservation corps and stuff. But that was also the very first farm bill came out of the New Deal. Um, and the U.S. government implemented something called supply management. And I won't get into every single aspect of it because it's quite wonky. But essentially, the government, you know, helped have price supports for farmers and farmers could voluntarily participate in these programs, reduce the amount that they're growing, but still be guaranteed to be given a fair price. And this was done by a number of ways. You know, sometimes farmers were given incentives, you know, paid basically to follow land that, um, you know, is maybe had been, you know, sown to, to intensely for a few years, um, really kind of protect marginal land, highly erodible land. There were incentives for farmers to plant um, soil building crops, things like legumes that, you know, really kind of fix nitrogen and such into the soil. And then there was just, you know, quotas and, you know, restrictions on how much to plant. Um, and that really kind of helped farmers have the guarantee to know that, look, I can, you know, step back a little bit. I can plant a little bit less. It's going to help the prices overall if everybody isn't on board. Um, and I can guarantee that I have, you know, a fair and living wage. Another part of that, too, was just in terms of, of grain reserves. So essentially what farmers would do is in years where, um, so the government would set a price floor, right? And this price floor was what we called parity. It was based off of covering the production costs of a farmer um, while also ensuring that they have livable wages and really wages on par with, with urban counterparts, right? Making sure that people in farm country are just not locked behind. And so at the beginning of the season, a farmer would take out a loan based on that price floor. At the end of the season, they would sell their crops and take, you know, basically pay that loan back to the government. But in years when the price of, you know, on the market fell below that price floor, rather than, you know, paying more, they would basically just give their crop to the government. They would still have that payment. They still knew what they're going to be paid, but they would give up that crop. And the federal government had, you know, loads of um, silos all across the country that was keeping this grain in reserve. So then in another year, let's say there were, you know, terrible dust storms again or other ecological disasters that reduced yield, we could sell those crops back into the market, recuperate the cost of these programs while still ensuring that, you know, the price of grain is stable and that consumers have access to the food that they need. And so these, these you know, systems were never perfect. There were a lot of people who were left behind in them, namely disadvantaged farmers, farmers of color, female farmers. But... Overall, they, you know, did do a pretty good job of stabilizing income for, for many decades. Amanda, when did we get rid of them? It's a wonderful question. Um, so corporations that, you know, were involved in, in grain trading and commodity trading and such from the very beginning pushed back. And they pushed back because it took away their power <laughs> within the marketplace, right? As soon as a farmer has a fairer price, that's going to be harder on the companies who, you know, want to profit as much as they want, as they can. Um, overproduction, you know, like I mentioned, is very bad for farmers. It's really good for the purchasers of those products, not the consumers necessarily, right? But the middlemen, you know, the processors that are standing between us and the farmers. As long as we overproduce, as long as the price of grain remains low, it's really, really good for the corporate uh, corporations that process all of that. And so, you know, there are attempts from the very beginning to challenge it and really over the years kind of chipped away at the supply management programs. The other aspect, too, is that we, you know, as, um, as, a, as a country started looking a lot more towards um, other ways of managing supply that really were, were false solutions. So one of which would be focusing on, on trade and exports as the way to manage supply. We've always traded in goods, and, you know, that's always going to be a part of our portfolio. But focusing on an export market to, you know, recuperate <laughs> um, problems from excess supplies is not a very stable way of doing it. Um, case in point, you know, in the 70s, you know, the, um, there's a famous line from one of the agricultural secretaries who said, you know, get big and get out, get big or get out and plants, plant fence row to fence row. And farmers listened and they, you know, took out huge loans because prices were really good and they planted as much as they could. And we exported the food that we didn't need. Well, you know, in the early 1980s, we had the Soviet grain embargo and that devastated farmers because all of a sudden we lost this huge part of the export market. And there weren't as much uh, robust programs in place to kind of stabilize um, the prices that farmers were receiving. Um, and then, you know, we had, you know, it's a little bit left of supply management, but really the last death knoll from it was um, in the 1996 Farm Bill that is oftentimes called the, the Freedom to Fail Bill. And that is really where the last vestiges of supply management were destroyed. And it was devastating, again, for farmers. Um, 
farmers overproduced and prices fell about 50% in just a couple of years for corn and for soy. And that's when these direct payments, these direct subsidies, they're often villainized, um, really came into play because otherwise we would have had farms go right out of business. And so then this created a system where, again, we don't have supply management. Farmers are overproducing. They're not making enough. The government is helping to pay so they can keep alive. Who benefits from this? You know, consumers don't necessarily benefit. Farmers definitely do not benefit. Um, taxpayers, you know, get upset that so much of their money goes to support this system. Once again, though, the purchasers of these grains are the ones who benefit. And this is when we really saw the rise of um, factory farming, right, which is another side of this coin, is when you have an excess supply of cheap grain, when purchasers can, you know, buy the grain off the market below sometimes even the cost of production, then it becomes much more cost effective to transform that grain into different things, you know, things like ethanol, as I mentioned, things like, um, food additives, but also into livestock feed. And so suddenly it became cheaper for a farmer to purchase livestock feed off the market than to raise their own, which meant that farms could raise ever larger number of animals, you know, within confinement. And so that's really where we saw the start of the rapid rise of factory farms in, in our country. Something you just said there is absolute insanity to me. And I think it's why the family farm, the, what it looks like, has changed so much. You know, I picture this in, back in the 40s and 50s, this beautiful diversified farm where you raised grain for the dairy cows and there were some hogs for, you know, the leftover um, milk waste or any, you know, uh, sort of the leftover grain harvest. It just, it was this diversified place where a lot of the inputs uh, were from, you know, the leftovers of the other system and it was very self-sustainable. And so, the fact that it costs you more to produce grain for your own animals, like if you're a dairy farmer, than it does for you to just buy grain off the farm seems so absurd to me. And, and you're telling me it's because of these subsidies that are relatively new, like since the 90s. Yeah, yeah. And that system has changed. We don't have the direct payments anymore. Those went away in 2014. But we do have um, crop insurance, which, you know, is an important safety net for farms. But... Crop insurance not only protects against, you know, bad weather events, it also protects against price slumps, right? So farmers pay in and federal tax dollars also subsidize um, <clears throat> this insurance policy for years when the prices are low. So rather than addressing the cause, which is overproduction, we're addressing the symptom, which is low prices, helping to keep farmers afloat, but perpetuating the system where exactly like you said, it makes no sense. We have made grain so artificially cheap that it is cheaper to purchase off the market rather than to grow your own. And like you said, you lose, you know, that's a really important part. And I think, you know, organic agriculture, it's really at the heart of it is how do you improve the soil and how do you have a system that is self-sustaining? You know, we don't have that anymore in most farm models because because of these this, you know, I would say broken system, but really <laughs> created by design by those who, you know, right. profit from it. And, and all in the name of feed the world, right? You mentioned that. And so it, they were justifying the use of all of these poisons because we have to feed the world. They're going hungry. Yeah. If I had a dollar for every time I heard a corporation say that they're trying to feed the world, then I would you know, be able to retire early. It's, it's not their interest in feeding the world, right? You know, they... Corporations that, that use that mantra oftentimes are pushing these production systems that, you know, you already mentioned are very inefficient at feeding people, right? 99% of the corn that we plant in the U.S. is not the sweet corn that we think about that we grill or, you know, boil and eat. It's corn that goes into food additives. A good 40% of it goes into ethanol. It goes into livestock feed that then feed cattle, that then feed people. So if we were actually, if these agribusinesses were actually interested in feeding the world, they would promote production systems that actually can produce way more calories than we're producing now. And they also wouldn't advocate for, you know, trade policies that really undermine the ability of farmers in the developing world to feed themselves, right? So we think about trade policies like, like NAFTA in the 90s and the way that it undermined um, farmers and, you know, across the border in Mexico who were driven off their land because they could not afford, they could not compete with these artificially low corn prices in the U.S. That's not feeding the world. So what does an eater do who's trying to get themselves out of the system and support something else when they're shopping? What can they do? That's a really good question. Yeah, I'm, 
you know, there's, there's a little bit that we can do if you have the means, you know, to purchase, you know, organic produce or locally grown food. Oftentimes it does cost more because a lot of times it's outside of that subsidy system, right? And so that's why you'll see higher prices, um, you know, sometimes at your farmer's market. You know, if you have the means to do that and it's important to you, we definitely encourage that. But at Food and Water Watch, we like to say that this is a problem that you can't shop your way out of. Um, and it's also a little unfair to put all the, the onus on, you know, consumers to fix this system that we didn't build and we didn't necessarily ask for. So I think really the best way to do that is just to really kind of, you know, vote for elected officials who, you know, actually will what stand up to to corporate agribusinesses look to see who's funding different campaigns there's a lot of dark money a lot of money out there um, being spent to try to keep this system in place and it's you know encouraging our existing officials to you know to vote for policies that support the family farmer that support access to nutrition benefits that you know support ecological farming and not ones that really you know maintain the status quo and you talked a little bit about the power that um certain players have over the policies. I'm curious, you know, how consolidation has kind of happened throughout the food system. So I know you recently published some findings in collaboration with The Guardian on, on that supermarket consolidation. And I'm curious if you could talk about that study. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so it's a study that it's actually going to be part of a series. We just released, or we're going to be releasing a second series in this, um, you know, in January, looking at factory farms, actually, um, in Iowa. But this first one, you know, started at where I think most of us um, interact with the food system the most, the supermarket, right? You know, there are, there are so many of us that, and I was one included, for the, you know, growing up, that that's kind of the beginning and the end of our, you know, interaction with the food system. Um, and, you know, I think the, the corporations behind, you know, manufacturing food for the grocery store and the supermarkets themselves do a really good job to make it seem like we have abundance, that we have choice, that we have variety. But what our study did is we looked at, you know, well, how many players are there actually in this system? The top four um, grocery sellers, so this would include stores like Amazon and Costco as well, take in about uh, two out of every three food dollars that we spend. So two out of every three dollars that we spend at the grocery stores really goes to, you know, four corporations. And they go by many names, right? So you can have, um, there's so many different subsidiaries of Kroger, for instance, um, that we might not realize that two different stores have different names and really they're owned by the same parent company. And then when you get inside the supermarket, it's a whole, <laughs> a whole other story. Um, so we use data, market research data. So data that's really, you know, usually purchased by other food companies that want to know who their competitors are, you know, how much hummus are 20 year olds eating these days, that sort of thing. And it, basically collects scanner data. So every time somebody purchases something at the supermarket, that data is saved and that goes, can be bought by companies to, you know, understand market trends. And so we looked at some of this data to see, okay, well, how many, you know, companies, for instance, you know, are making our breakfast cereals or how many companies are producing our bread or our milk or whatever. And we found that across, we looked at about 55 different categories. And we found that um, on average, you know, the top four companies controlled about 60% of the market. Um, and that's a problem. <laughs> so when we talk about antitrust and we talk about corporate consolidation, you know, anything below, above like 50 to 60% is, is problematic, right? That's not a competitive marketplace. But there were some categories, like we looked at dip sales that were over 90% controlled by just one company. <laughs> <laughs> so there is rapid consolidation across the supermarket shelves. But this is something that we don't necessarily notice because, like I mentioned, you go in and there's, you know, tons of different varieties of everything you buy. Bread is one example. Um, if you go to the grocery store, maybe you're trying to choose between, um, you know, Nature's Own or um, Dave's Killer Bread or other types of bread that maybe look like they're a healthier choice. Well, both of those are actually owned by the producers of Wonder Bread, a company called Flower Foods that most of us have not even heard of. Um, when you go to buy, you know, soy milk, the vast majority of soy milk is controlled just by one company, Dannon. And so it's, it's really hard. I think this kind of goes back to your earlier question of what can, can consumers do it's really hard for us to kind of purchase, you know, to vote with our forks when we have an ever dwindling, you know, variety of choices of companies to, to purchase from in the first place. And explain, dive in a little bit, because I know this is really confusing to people who aren't kind of in this world. Why does it matter that there's only a few choices? 
Like why, why does it matter that um, they're all owned by one company? Does that company then have a ton of power when it comes to policies? Is that kind of the point? Yes, that's definitely part of the point. As these corporations get more powerful, their lobbying influence also gets more powerful as well. Um, I mean, you think about like, we just revamped, went from the food pyramid to like a food plate format when you're talking about, you know, what does a healthy diet look like? The older food pyramid that had so much at the bottom with like grains and bread and milk had a huge, huge portion of that. I mean, that was really influenced by by corporations, right? <laughs> by the lobbyists that produce milk and grains and things. And so, you know, it's it's easy even for um, corporations to influence the nutritional guidelines that the U.S. government has. And they only can happen if they have, you know, a huge amount of power. Um, you know, there's there, a few years ago, there are all these you know, studies on how healthy chocolate is and all the flavonoids and different things you can have with chocolate. Well, those are all just, you know, funded by Nestle and other companies as well. So, um, and it can also have, you know, it has an impact on um, making it really difficult for, for new players to enter the market, right? So when you have that much power um, over the supermarket, it's really hard for a smaller player to come in, right? Because you can, you know, Decide if you're a big company and you have, you know, your arms in many different baskets and you're producing lots of different things. And let's say another company wants to come compete with you with cereal. Well, you can sell your cereal at or below the cost of production for a little while, drive them out of business, and then go back to making more money like you were before. Um, there's also, we, you know, talked a little bit about a lot of other kind of really nefarious things happening on the supermarket shelves. I mean, just where things are placed, you know, has a lot to do with how much money and power different companies have. So there are things that are called slotting fees. So a corporation will pay um, more money to have their um, items, you know, in the center of an aisle at eye level. Maybe, you know, even additional money for those kind of end of aisle displays that you can see. That's all paid for. And so if you don't have that kind of money, if you can't pay to play, then you end up having your stuff shelved somewhere else. Sometimes supermarkets even charge you to actually, like, keep their food on the shelves, right? So there's there's a lot going on here. Um and there's also some really, you know, it's not just about not having as many varieties of cereal or something. I mean, there have been some pretty nefarious things that have happened. Um, the formula industry, for instance, I think it's about the top three companies, I want to say, control about 90, 95 percent of the dry formula market. That's a huge issue because um, these companies have really kind of leveraged their power to push for um, promoting formula at home and especially abroad. Not, there's nothing wrong with formula. Lots of mothers choose to, to feed their children formula. But, you know, there are lots of signs, too, about the importance of, you know, promoting breastfeeding as much as you can. And so companies like Nestle have gone into developing countries and really kind of promoted formula as being better and more nutritious than breast milk. And there have been instances of this happening in areas where the drinking water is not reliable and not safe. And that becomes a real issue if you're mixing unsafe water with formula to feed your baby because, you know, Nestle told you it was better and that's what makes you a good mom. So there are, you know, there are a lot of really negative things that can happen when these corporations have that much power and are able to really kind of leverage that for terrible reasons. And I really want to just kind of dive in on this specific topic because I think it relates so much to the Real Organic Project, why we've created a label and an add-on because the local food movement, the local organic food movement, were really affected by this. Even as small scale a farm as we have here, which is two acres, we've already exhausted our sales for um, farmer's market and kind of direct market in our community. And there's lots of other farms here. And we do not feel like we can expand because we cannot get that shelf space. And that, that program, that spin program, I think, is I've heard about where it's this, this whole algorithm for what sells. And of course, it's self-reinforcing. It's a positive feedback loop. If you've bought shelf space, then of course, you're going to score really high on what's getting purchased, too, and advertising dollars and everything you're just talking about. Um, this is huge because it's, a, it's affecting our good food movement because our farms can't expand and we are kept on the fringe, standing behind the farmer's market stands, even though we've gotten really good at kind of specializing and regular year-round crops, we, we can't get that shelf space. So um, th this is huge. Let's, let's kind of talk a little bit about how this has affected organic, which was such a good food movement to start with, and what do we do about it? Do we, do we completely start over with a new label? Do you feel like organic is somehow out of the system or is it part of it? And if so, you know, what steps can we take to kind of save it? Yeah, I think there's a million ways we can go with that. Um, I think I'll answer it in, in a couple parts. So in terms of like, do we just 
throw in the towel and start over? Like, I don't think so. <laughs> it might be tempting to say that, but, you know, until we address, you know, the problem of monopoly, monopoly power within our food system, we're going to be in the same, you know, place that we're at now in 20 years, right? You know, we have lots of companies that have just bought out smaller, you know, startup organic firms and then just kind of, you know, mold them into their business models. So the same company that might, you know, sell you a kind bar, for instance, um, is Mars, who also makes candy bars. So we have one side of the coin of producing and promoting something really healthy and then something that's not necessarily. And so if we don't address that and if we were to start a brand new label, we're going to be in the same position in 20 years from now. Um, and so, but the other part of that question too is, you know, how do we give smaller organic um, local farms that kind of fighting chance? And you're absolutely right. You know, farmers markets are wonderful and they're very important, but I think they only amount for about 1% of all food sales in this country. And it's, it can be really hard because they tend to be, you know, I live in the Washington DC area. We have like a farmer's market, a stone's throw away from everywhere, I feel like. And they're very pricey though. And so it's, it's harder if you're of lower income to, to shop there. And then there are parts of the country that don't even have the capacity or the infrastructure to have that. And so what are those people supposed to eat? Um, and so, you know, it kind of goes back again, I think ties into the report we did really well, because it's not just a matter of competing between different food brands. It's also where can you take your food to, where can you sell it? Um, you know, one solution is to really kind of pour more, more of our resources into developing local food hubs. Um, and by local food hubs, it's really kind of being that mediary between a small farm and, you know, the person who ends up eating it. And it's not just grocery stores, right? You know, I think we actually spend the majority of our food dollars nowadays um, away from home. You know, it's a little different now in the middle of this ongoing pandemic, but, you know, prior to the pandemic, you know, a lot of food was spent, a lot of food was eaten at restaurants, um, on lunch breaks, school cafeterias, you know, food service institutions. Um, how do you get small farmers markets into those areas as well? And so that's really kind of a challenge, but there have been some really good kind of creative solutions of how to get there. Um, I can talk about one example that, that I um, looked into in a report we did earlier. Um, so there's this organization called the Hmong American Farmers Association. Um, they're in the Twin Cities of, of Minneapolis. Um, and they do a few different things. They have some land that they own that they lease out to um, Americans of Hmong descent. And that gives them an opportunity to, to have their hand at farming. It's, you know, acres are very small. It's like five to 10 acre plots, I believe. You know, it's, it's very prohibitively expensive to, to start a brand new farm nowadays. You know, there's one study that looked at everything it would take to just have a conventional grain farm in the U.S. And it would be about half a million dollars in terms of all the education and all the, you know, machinery and the land itself and the expertise that you need to get to be able to be a successful farm. And so this organization provides opportunities to get people back onto the land. But what they also do is they don't just leave the farmers hanging. You know, the farmers markets in in the Twin City area are really already overly saturated and already the Hmong communities, you know, make up the majority of the sales and, you know, they're losing ability to, to market other places. And so what the, what Hoffa, the Hmong American uh, Farming Association does is actually purchases in bulk from these farmers. So farmers can sign up to, to have their food purchased. And this is a nonprofit. It's not, you know, a greedy middleman that's trying to make money, but they'll purchase from small farms in bulk and then they'll sell you know, involved to, you know, local institutions, schools and restaurants and hotels that can use that food. And that's really a way to give farmers an ability to sell to those, you know, places where we purchase the vast majority of our food. Um, there is examples like that in other parts of the country as well. And it's really, you know, when it's community driven, um, when it's, you know, nonprofits, when it's really about building, you know, resources for local farmers and re revitalizing local communities, it can be a really impactful way. I remember going to the Minneapolis farmers market and just being shocked at how low the prices were there. So I'm really glad to hear that the, cause it seemed to me like it was under the cost of production just as a farmer and looking at what, what the prices were going for. So I'm really glad to hear that. It seems like um, that was really needed. Um, oh, absolutely. So I can share another are... example that we did. Um, we spoke to a grocery cooperative in, in Oakland. Um, and this was a cooperative that came up in an area that hadn't had a supermarket in 50 years any kind of grocery store. And this is another problem with consolidation is that not only are supermarkets owned by, you know, just a few companies right now, they're also much bigger than they used to be. And there's much fewer of them. So, and when you're a corporation, you're going to 
quit a supermarket where you're going to make the most money. And that's probably not going to be a low income area. It's probably not going to be an area with, you know, a few white residents. And so there are lots of communities that have been left behind, um, you know, in this rapid consolidation that we've had. But cooperatives are a very different model. Um, they actually started with seed money from another cooperative in the Bay Area. And the goal, as, as the woman I spoke to, is cooperation, not competition. Um, people who work at the cooperative can actually buy in shares in the company and they can help kind of, you know, basically if the cooperatives as well, the, the employees do well as, um, as well. They also have, you know, access to benefits and to ability to put um, retirement plans into place and things that we don't really think about when uh, we think about, you know, food work. But it's also really good because they intentionally, you know, purchase local nutritious food for the community members they provide cooking classes and other you know recipe cards and you know ways for people to get engaged and learn how to use fresh produce because a lot of us you know there are things i see at the farmer's market that i don't know what it is or how to cook with it um, and they also are very intentional about purchasing from local farmers especially black farmers who have really been left away you know left out of the system that we have um, and the woman i spoke to said that you know she actually has to convince you know, the farmer she works with to take more money for their produce because they're like, oh, this is a great cause. You know, we'll, we'll sell it to you at this price. And she's like, no, we're going to sell it to you at this price so that you can, you know, maintain a, a steady living income. And so it provides, you know, a guaranteed market for, for those small scale local farmers and a way to connect them with people who are eating in their own neighborhood. But, you know, people who don't have access to, you know, a farmer's market. Yeah. You know, you're talking so much about consolidation as being so much a part of the system. It's interesting because usually when I'm talking to other people in the organic movement, it's about all of the rules that the National Organic Program is not enforcing. And that if we just fix that, everything would be fixed. Do you think that's true or do we still have to address consolidation? You absolutely need to address consolidation as well. I mean, there's, there's always room for improvement and that's, that's why the organics, you know, standards are, are a living document that can be, you know, can be tweaked and we can always do better enforcement and stuff. But I mean, there is, there is an attempt early on in the organic movement to allow irradiation and cloning and sewage sludge. And that was all an industry attempt, right? I mean, thankfully we fought back against that and you know, the organic label is stronger because of it, but there's always going to be fights and there's always going to be money and lobbying money put in to, to making the system, you know, rigged for the big producers. And so absolutely we can't, we can't fix any any problem in our food system if we aren't addressing monopoly power. Yeah. And so what does that look like on your end? What are you what are some of the things you're fighting for in, in Washington? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we really need to put a pause button on on mega mergers, right? So, you know, there was there used to we used to have more rigorous antitrust law and more rigorous, you know, oversight and enforcement in this country, but that was kind of really pushed aside um, for a number of reasons partly because of growing corporate power, but also just an attitude by, you know, Republican and Democratic administrations alike that, you know, efficiency is more important than, than monopoly power. But that brought us to a very, a very bad place. Um, so part of it is just stopping, you know, these mega mergers from happening. You know, back in like the 1930s and 40s, there was this big supermarket chain called A&P and the U.S. government went after it because it had, you know, it was doing predatory pricing, it was driving out competitors, um, breaking all these antitrust laws. And at the height of their power, they had maybe about half the market share that like Walmart has today. <laughs> so like we have basically, because we stopped, you know, enforcing and being so critical of mergers, we allowed companies, you know, like Walmart, for instance, even though they didn't grow from mergers, they grew by predatory pricing and driving competitors out. And they were only able to do that in a, lands a political landscape that turned the other eye. So the first thing to do would be to support legislation um, there's a bill that we expect to be reintroduced again called the um, Agribusiness Merger Moratorium and Antitrust Review Act. It's a bit of a mouthful, but what that one would do is um, basically is stop. a nice acronym? A nice, there isn't. There's not a pretty acronym, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that would, do, really, would basically put a pause on mergers above a certain amount um, and then also, you know, create a study. And, you know, there's, there's thoughts of can we even go back and undo mergers and break up big corporations that have happened? Um, you know, because there have been a lot, even in the past past 10 years, Kraft and Heinz came together. Now they're one of the biggest food manufacturers ever. You see consolidation and, you know, across the crop um, industry and the livestock industry, chemical inputs, Dow DuPont, Bayer Monsanto, all these big um conglomerates keep coming together and building even more power. So we have to stop it, right? 
we need to go back. We need to review, you know, look for, you know, abuses of power. Where does it make sense to, to break up companies and spin them off into smaller, into smaller companies? But aside that as well, I mean, there's, there's other things we need to do as well just beyond that. That would be like the very first step, the very kind of <laughs> bare minimum. Yeah. And it seems like this has been kind of, it hasn't mattered what party is in the office. No. Would you say that's true? I mean, we've had Democrats and Republicans in, in control, in power. And, and since you said some of these changes were only made in the 90s, you mm-hmm. know, uh, what do we need to do? Oh, absolutely. Unfortunately, I mean, both sides have been pretty much equally guilty. Um, you know, I've been reading this book called Goliath, which is um, written by somebody who's a monopolist expert. And he really is laying, you know, laying the blame on both sides of the administration. I mean, you can put a lot of blame maybe into the Reagan administration, but the same principles were carried over through Clinton, um, through Obama even. <laughs> and so we just have not had a national dialogue of why, you know, monopoly power is bad. We've had this, we've really embraced the idea that efficiency is more important than market, market power. But look, look to where it's brought us today. Um, But I I am hopeful. We're starting to have a little bit more of a conversation about it. I think, you know, the atrocities that we've seen with like Facebook and other social media accounts, um, you know, the spreading of false information, um, you know, January 6th, all that kind of those probes, you know, they're really kind of looking at, okay, what happens when our news media is super consolidated, when our social media is super consolidated, what kind of nefarious things can happen? And there have been some probes um, on the Hill against, you know, Mark Zuckerberg and his company, Facebook or Meta or whatever they call themselves now. So I'm hopeful that, you know, it just takes a matter of like shifting the the focus over to other industries as well, including agriculture. I mean, farmers have known this forever, right? And pharma communities and advocates in the field have known this, have been sounding the alarm. It's just a matter of our, you know, politicians waking up and and listening to the people. Are you suggesting we should have other values besides price? (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely. What are some of those values that are important? Yeah, I mean, ecological sustainability is really important. Um, you know, justice, you know, fair prices for everybody who produces your food. You know, it's not it's not fair to expect farmers to live, you know, to, you know, spend more growing food than they make getting back in it. It's not fair to make them, you know, live off of subsidies because that's the only way. It's not fair to, you know, have people who bag your groceries or who work in the slaughterhouses or on assembly lines and, and manufacturing facilities to not have benefits, to get paid, you know, below living wages. It's not fair. That's not low prices in the end are really just mask other problems that are that are happening within the system. And so to have a really, you know, I would say in my ideal utopian food system, it would be one that, you know, really supports people along every step of the food production chain, does not leave the workers and the farmers behind as well. And it's actually not even cheaper if you consider things like climate change (laughs) into the equation, right? And all of the pollution of the fertilizer runoff, the dead zones, you know. So um, let's talk a little bit about, I know climate is a hot topic right now, about your thoughts on what we should be doing and what actually is happening. Um, Because I I know there's a lot of talk about in agriculture around carbon credits. And Mm -hmm. uh, is this a good idea? That's a terrible idea. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah, I mean, I I actually just wrote a whole issue brief on this. I would love to pick your brain on that a little bit more. Um, Yeah, it's it's what we would refer to as as greenwashing. Um, So there's a number of issues with it. But, you know, to sum it up, it's carbon credits are no are just a way for, you know, a polluting corporation to say, look over here, I'm, you know, promoting these, I'm sequestering carbon into the soil. I'm, it's okay for me to keep polluting because a farmer over here is doing this good practice. Um, and I suppose I should start out with a quick example of what we're talking about for people that aren't aware of it. Um, so the whole idea of like, pollu- we like to call it pollution trading, right? But it's often called, it's called carbon trading. So you oh, might we have- We like to put like really nice words on- I know, on right? Things, don't we? Yeah. <laughs> Make it all sound <laughs> like all nice. Like natural gas. That's methane, exactly. everybody, right? <laughs> right. Exactly. Yep. So pollution training um, is what we like to call it. So the idea that maybe you have, like, you know, when you're purchasing an airline ticket and you feel, maybe you feel guilty already that you're flying somewhere. And then that little box comes up and is like, oh, click this, spend more money even. And we're going to offset, you know, all of your entire trip by planting a forest, you know, in Brazil or something. That's what we're talking about offsets. Um, 
So why would an airline do, interest to do that? Do they do they actually care that much about you know um, carbon sequestration, or are they just trying to make it look like they're taking you know a step in the right direction while not changing their practices one bit, right? And it's basically just you know creative accounting. You know you're able to continue to have business as usual, right? Because somebody else may or may not be sequestering carbon. But there are a lot of problems with this. Um, so the type of carbon that, you know, there's different carbon cycles, not to get too sciencey here though. But so you know, fossil fuels are called fossil for a reason, right? We're burning dead dinosaurs, right? <laughs> so things have been underground for, you know, thousands to millions of years. Um, the carbon that is sequestered in farming, you know, it definitely can be sequestered. It doesn't go back down, you know, deep into the ground and not come up again for millions of years, right? You can have, you know, for instance, a field sequester a significant amount of carbon, but then if you plow that field up <laughs> the next year, that carbon can be released. There's a lot of uncertainty. Even the scientists who study, you know, soil carbon sequestration cannot even come to an adequate figure to estimate how much soil is sequestered in different practices. So we have people moving full speed ahead saying that this is a solution when in fact we don't even know, we don't even have the numbers straight to know like how much we can actually, how much of a difference we can make. All we know is that we're trading short term, you know, temporary storage um, in the soil for, you know, an, as an excuse to not keep fossil fuels in the ground. And there's another reasons of like, you know, you have to look at who's really pushing this, right? So it's, it's big companies that have these, you know, net zero pledges, which is another sort of <laughs> nice kind of happy term that doesn't really have a lot of meaning um, behind it. So it's companies that want to have net zero pledges and it's companies like fossil fuel companies um, and power plants and, um, you know, other polluting industries that want to keep business as usual. Um, and there's also, you know, it's also put up as a way to help farmers out, right? And obviously farmers do need, <laughs> they need help, they need incentives to, we just talked about earlier about how there are no, there aren't adequate incentives in place for farmers to to plant cover crops, to do crop rotation, to have those diversified farms that we really want to see. So this is also, you know, as a way to sort of fund, fund those practices, but we have programs in place. We have programs in the USDA in place that come in our farm bills that really do incentivize those practices without giving, you know, polluters basically a free pass. And one final thing I'll so, say, and then I'll stop hating on <laughs> carbon markets, no, it's, though. It's a that, good point. It's confusing, too, though, because you do want polluters to pay, and it does make sense they would go towards, for example, farmers who are doing you, you know, eco, what we call ecosystem services. Mm -hmm. um, so, so uh, what, what, is a, what is a better solution if this one is so fraught with um, greenwashing and, and maybe fudging the numbers, like you said? And yeah, regulations. We need regulations. We need incentives to transition as quickly as we can to, you know, 100% clean energy, renewable economy, right? So we're not going to get there with half measures. We're not going to get there as long as, you know, Corporations like Exxon want to drill even more than they ever have. So regulations are, are the way forward. And but we also need to, you know, have incentives in place um, and also, you know, help people out so that no one is left behind. You know, the workers who are in these industries, you know, so that they can have good jobs that they can transition to make sure that we aren't driving up energy prices for low income communities and such. And so there's a lot that needs to come into play as well. But, you know, at the end of the day, one of the most nefarious things about not only are we, you know, damning our planet if we go down the road of carbon credits, but if you're, you know, a community that lives near a polluting facility, a manufacturing facility, a power plant, you know, that company gets to keep doing and, you know, polluting your air and your water and, by, and also claim that they're net zero. So it's really leaving behind the communities that, you know, are at the forefront of that pollution to begin with. We did a study um, a few years back looking at the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, and this is a carbon trading system between um, a few states in the eastern United States. And we actually found that pollution increased um, next to, you know, vulnerable communities that were living next to these power plants once the system was in place. So these companies were purchasing these, you know, credits, and they actually increased pollution. So the people living around next to it did not see any improvement. In fact, they saw things get worse. Not in my backyard, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about the word regenerative because I have a lot of friends that are actually in government and they will not use the word organic, but they love to use the word regenerative. Can we talk about what's going on there? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, I think part of it stems back to what you asked earlier, like do we throw the towel in and just start over? And I think 
that's part of the attraction of regenerative because it is so new and people, you know, have pointed out some of the faults within the organic system. So it's like, well, let's not use organic anymore. Let's use regenerative. Regenerative is a step beyond organic. Um, but the problem with between, you know, comparing regenerative and organic is that there is no definition of regenerative, right? There's no one set definition. It's a loose, loosely guided principle of, you know, basically everything organic does, which is, you know, sort of a closed system farming system that regenerates soil, um, focuses on soil health, etc. Um, but organic, you know, has a set of standards. It has, you can point to a label that has rigorous standards and enforcement in place. Um, so you know what it, what it means when it's labeled organic. When somebody says their farming system is regenerative or their food is produced regeneratively, that can mean whatever they want it to mean. And right now it's really also being greenwashed by different corporations. Syngenta, Monsanto, you know, um, General Mills are all promoting <laughs> products that they do as regenerative. You know, you Syngenta will say that you can buy their chemical inputs and use it as part of a regenerative system. So it's, it's pretty meaningless. So we like to use organic regenerative <laughs> as a phrase, but we're also have, like, we're, always have a yeah. foot. Yeah, because that way it's like we want to pay homage to the organic. That's the other part, too, is we don't want to, you know, we want to pay homage to the people that have worked their lives to, to promote, you know, and um, to keep the organic label for what it is, right? To, to keep it, um, the integrity of the organic label. So to completely throw it aside and say, focus just on regenerative is like, you're building off the work of decades of people within the organic movement um, and just throwing it aside. And that's not fair. Yeah, I read a really interesting Civil Eats article where it was now regenerative milk. It was conventional milk, but the step that they were taking to be able to call themselves regenerative, um, it was completely confined dairy cows, but they were purchasing from grain that was no-till, but they were using the usual fertilizers, any chemicals they wanted, and even more herbicides to do the you know final spray down to make it easier to harvest. So that is what that group was calling regenerative dairy now. So I just, I hope everybody realizes that we are gonna have to go through the same thing with regenerative as we did with organic and actually define it. Cause everybody is saying, well, I took this one little step. And of course it's a great step that, um, you know, there's no till going on, but people, we need real transparency and there is so much confusion in the marketplace. And that's actually one of the criticisms that we get by introducing another label. It's, but there's so much confusion and one of my responses is, would you rather eaters be confused or misled? Because right now they're being misled. There's no transparency. The, the labels say so many things. So would you talk a little bit about that, what, how they're being misled in the marketplace? Because um, there are so many words out there that just have zero meaning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like, I like the way that you said that. Would you rather be you know, confused or misled? Um, we updated a, a fat little kind of guide for shoppers on food labels because you said, like you said, there is so much confusion and like misleading happening right now. Um, we really held up organic as like, look, this is the gold standard label. You know, this is a label that actually has really rigorous standards. You can look them up. They are updated. They have input from farmers, you know, people who are behind the organic and really care about the soil and stuff. But there are tons of different ways that you are allowed to label things. Um, and most of the food labels you see are not at all regulated by any meaningful way, right? You know, there are some definitions for, you know, for example, natural means something when it comes to, I think, meat and poultry. It doesn't mean anything on any other kind of product. And by natural meat and poultry, it means that, like, there's no, like, added preservatives or something. So you could have, you know, a cow that spent its life, you know, standing in its own feces on a factory farm, and it could be labeled as natural. That doesn't really mean anything. Um, you know, you can also label things as local and farm fresh and all sorts of different things that really, again, there's no standards in place. There's actually, you know, companies are allowed to make a claim and then just self-certify, <laughs> just basically send USDA some documentations. I'm like, well, this is why we said this is local, or this is why we said this is healthy. And USDA can check off without ever stepping foot on an operation to, you know, ensure that that is in place. And, you know, it's it's coming from people are, are buying these, you know, it's coming from a good place, right? People want to, you know, understand that they want to support local farms. They want to, you know, make sure they're purchasing things um, that are more healthy. But we're just, like you said, constantly being misled in the grocery store, you know. So unless it's, you know, has an organic seal on it, there isn't a lot behind it. You know, there, there are some, you know, third-party labels for, you know, humane certified and stuff. Um, 
And if people are interested in, in purchasing from those, you know, I encourage you to go onto their websites and look at the standards. Do they have them listed? You know, um, there was one, I can't remember the name of it, so I can't call them out, but <laughs> there's one of those um, third party labels that actually allowed you to raise your hens in confined operations and never see the light of day. And that was, you know, considered humane and that was not not the case. So, yeah, I encourage people who do. American Humane Certified is not as good as Certified Humane. Okay. Confusing. Yeah. Yeah. And see, I'm, yeah, I couldn't even articulate that. I can't remember which one was. Which, so. Right. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, and it's always for me, it's like, look behind the label. Who brought you this? You know, and that tells so much. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's one thing, you know, going back to the supermarket report we did is that, you know, a lot of these meat companies, you don't buy, not everything you purchase that comes from, you know, Cargill or from Tyson or Purdue is going to have their label on it, right? I mean, they have a whole bunch of different labels that, you know, go by different names. So maybe you, you maybe you have an aversion to Tyson because you've heard all the horrors and then you go buy something from the grocery store. It turns out it could be from them as well. And many of them are do kind of mimic, you know, healthier, local, organic kind of food without being that. I feel like we've really focused on the Midwest, but we get all of our vegetables and nuts and so much of our food from California. So let's talk a little bit about what's going on with California ag and some of the water concerns. Do you have some thoughts on that? Oh my gosh, yes. Um, one of my researchers just you know, re- released this amazing analysis looking at basically calling out big ag and big oil in California. As we know, there's, you know, ongoing drought that's been plaguing the state. Um, Water resources are running dry, Um, but there are some big, big producers that have really gone and really allocated much of the water rights that are, that they have, right? So in California, basically in the West, there's, you know, this water rights system that sort of like a first come first serve basis. So if you've had water rights, you know, that extend back to when the state was founded, you get water before somebody who maybe has rights that were founded later, right? Um, And unfortunately, some of the biggest companies have really kind of, you know, amassed a lot of power and a lot of these resources. But California, you know, as you mentioned, does grow a ton of our produce. I think it's like the leading producer of, you know, for instance, like nuts that we have. um, And it exports a lot out of the U.S. as well. But a lot of the crops they grow are very water thirsty. You know, pecans, almonds take a tremendous amount of water to grow. And it's really not a sustainable place or a system at all. Um, but, you know, consumers' interest in eating healthy, um, you know, including, you know, switching from cow's milk to almond milk are somewhat pushing, you know, the growth of, of this almond industry in California. Um, another another part that I think gets less attention is, is dairy. Um, you know, California has some of the largest mega dairies in the country. Um, and so these aren't, you know, pasture-based sort of systems. These are confined systems that really depend on, as I mentioned, you know, earlier in our talk, um, livestock feed being purchased off site. And so tons and tons of fields in California are dedicated to growing alfalfa, which is another very thirsty crop that goes into to feeding cows. And actually, we our, our researchers discovered that there are um, a ton of, of bushels of alfalfa being sold to, you know, other countries, or I think it was some farmland is owned by Saudi Arabia. And they grow off alpha to export it back to their country because Saudi Arabia is, as we know, a desert. <laughs> and they've stopped growing off alpha because it's a terrible idea to grow it in the desert. So basically we're exporting water resources in that sense um, to other countries, you know, when we don't have enough to go around right now. So and I think they have some really horrible yeah, stories of just completely draining their own aquifers to grow alfalfa. And, and it just kind of happened really a lot quicker that, you know, what's doomed to happen to us. They've, they've kind of gone through it. Yeah, I mean, essentially, our, our farm system doesn't discriminate on on where you're growing something, right? So cotton is another very water-thirsty crop. It's not even one that feeds people, right? Still, still is important. Um, but, you know, there are a lot of cotton farmers in Arizona, which makes absolutely no sense. Um, and they're only able to stay afloat because of, you know, again, this farm safety net system. So it incentivizes the growth of industries, you know, cotton in places that are really should not be growing it because of the, the climate around them. And so, again, it kind of, again, goes back to we need to reform our, our food system to really kind of align with the climate reality and, you know, not <laughs> raise cotton in the desert, not raise almonds um, in places where there are ongoing droughts, um, you know, not raising cattle in confinement, on confinement operations, um, and really helping existing farms, you know, transition and giving them the tools and the resources to transition to more sustainable models. 
Yeah, it's astonishing to me that we don't have the foresight to, um, you know, we're just over extracting from the aquifers to set up these huge CAFOs out here in the desert. Uh, like mm -hmm. you said, cotton that's, you know, shipped other places. So I have no problem with California feeding California, but I do think for resilience and sustainability into the future when, when there are weather disruptions or water disruptions, you know, for California or any, any other kind of disruptions, we're going to need local food systems to be able to feed ourselves. It's um, the reality too, that we don't, we'd be told we've got to feed the world, but the reality is all over the world, these local food systems are the reality of how people get fed. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like cooperatives is a big thing that you've put forward as a solution. Is there anything else that, you know, in your heart of hearts, you're really fighting for right now um, in the farm bill or just personally uh, to try to fix this really broken system? We have a lot of work, don't we? We do. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think another step of that is, you know, banning factory farms. Um, and so a piece of legislation that we like to look to um, is the Farm System Reform Act. Um, and what that, what really makes that one special is that it doesn't, you know, it would end new and expanding factory farms, right? We're not telling people they need to shut their farms down tomorrow and go get a different job, right? That's not the reality. It would stop, you know, new farm factory farms above a certain size from being permitted. Um, and it would stop the expansion of existing factory farms. But it also would have, um, I think it was a $10 billion bailout fund that would help farmers basically transition to different systems. So if you are an operator of a factory farm, you know, doing farm on your own land, you're not a corporate farm, you could tap into this money and use it to maybe switch to a pasture-based system, maybe grow especially crops, you know, fruits and vegetables, whatever is, you know, appropriate for your area. And so it's, it doesn't, you know, it's sort of like a dress transition bill that, that would also be needed to, to make this transition in a way that's more equitable. I can't imagine as a farmer too, not wanting to transition as well. I mean, you talked about your mom leaving the farm and why she didn't want to be there. I can't imagine wanting um, a factory farm in my backyard. You know, so uh, I, I hope that we can um, figure out how to make it uh, a wonderful place to be again, <laughs> the farm. And, you know, something that I think people work that people enjoy, we do see that in young people, right? They want to farm and they want to farm differently. Um, yeah. Do you think it would have been different for your mom? Maybe if have you ever talked about that? Is that fam uh, farm still in your family? I haven't talked about. Yeah, it's not in our family, unfortunately. My grandfather, when he retired, he's, he sold the land. Um, yeah, I don't think it, I don't. And part of it just might have been personality. It, it wasn't for her. But I do wonder if that would have changed if, you know, if they had lived on the farm, for instance. I mean, they had a farm. They lived in town and had a farm, farmland, you know, away. And yeah, it was literally she didn't what she didn't like about it was sitting on a tractor going around and around and around. And that was like her entire experience. So it might have been different if it was, you know, diversified. Um, yeah, and I'll just I guess I'll give a plug for for our next you know, um, report in the series, on the supermarket series, this next one we'll look at um, Iowa in particular and factory hog farms. And exactly what you just said is, is making farming again, you know, I read about somewhere as being described as farming as a vocation, right? And I, I really like that. I really kind of touched upon that. And so, you know, this piece will talk about how this factory farm model has really hurt real communities, that it's actually now they're worse off than they were, you know, 25 years ago, despite the fact that they're producing, you know, 10 times as many hogs every year as they used to. And so how can we realign these systems to not only, you know, acknowledge the climate reality that we're in and reduce the amount of, of livestock that we produce, but also raise the prices for farmers and make rural communities places where people want to return to and, and live again. I was just speaking with a farmer who I partner with quite a bit. She's a, on our board and Real Organic uh, certified as well. And she goes, we're going to hell in a handbasket. We have so much work. And there's just such an urgency. Um, do you feel that? And do you feel like uh, there's hope? There's definitely a lot of urgency. And, you know, part of my job is unfortunately reading all the, the terrible news about, you know, how we have <laughs> very, very little time left. But you have to have hope. If I didn't have hope, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing right now, right? And I have hope in, you know, the passion of the people that I work with, with, you know, people across the organizations, you know, and hope in just the people power that we can build because, you know, we have fought back against corporate power in the past and we, we can do it again. Thank you, Amanda. It's, I learn so much every time I talk to you. Thank you for today. This is a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to the Real Organic Podcast. We hope that you will subscribe, tell your friends, and leave us a rating and review. A video version of this interview, as well as the full transcript with links related to our conversation, 
It's found at realorganicproject.org forward slash episode 64. Please join us next time when our guest is Bernward Geyer, the former director of iFilm, the International Federation of Organic Agriculture Movements. To support this podcast, our certified farmers, become a recurring donor at realorganicproject.org and see you next time.